All right, on number one, define inclusio. What is that? So, so we've got an intro and a conclusion, and they're, they're, they match up, to use Brian's words, either thematically, stylistically, there's something that the prophet will do that will draw your attention, either thematically or stylistically, that you can see, okay, that's the beginning, that's the end. It separates off a message. So however you would say that. And then chiasm is a more sophisticated or elaborate form of that. And what do we want to add to that? Because really a chiasm includes an inclusio. But how do we, what's the more elaborate form of a chiasm? First half is going to mirror the second half and emphasize what's at the, at the center of the Okay, so somewhere in here, there's going to be a center. Okay, and... What, what generally people will understand is that center oftentimes is the focal point. Okay, that's where, that's where your attention is being drawn because the message is there. And so there will be different elements as you go through. And these, these aspects will mirror each other, either a word or a concept. Um, there's, a, there's a message that's being given. And there's a correspondence, you know, one way to think about it, there's a correspondence between the beginning and the end, and then all the elements moving towards the center, where oftentimes there's this climax. Even in narrative, there's a book out by a guy by the name of David Dorsey, and he actually says the entire Old Testament is written with chiasmus, or a chiasm, where in every narrative, every aspect, there's a movement toward a center. And so you can find his book. He will break down every single passage in the Old Testament. And I think it's forced a little bit, um, especially because I don't think he follows the natural breaks that are sometimes very, very obvious. He overlaps them. And I, I don't see how you can do that if there's an obvious break somewhere. But he, I mean, that's how prominent it is in the way they wrote, in the way they thought. And so even in the deliverance of a sermon, you're going to find some of this. Okay, you got this? Yes, Blaze. Is that just as obvious in the English as it is in the Hebrew? Okay, that's a good question. Is it just as obvious in the English as it is in the Hebrew? Not always, because in, transla in translation, sometimes you lose whatever that aspect is that was going to catch your attention. Because when you really get into this, oftentimes you can even have the way Hebrew letters are written that will catch your attention. They just stand out and you go, whoa, what was that? And it just, it's just one of those things. It's like a neon sign that just catches your attention. Well, in English, you're going to lose some of that. In fact, in English translations, we lose a lot of the nuance that's there in the Hebrew language. Now, some people really get into the Hebrew language stuff, and they'll even say, notice that even in the, in the words that are being used for this message, you can hear in the sounds, the imagery, even in the cadence of the way, you know, it's like, whoa, okay, that's way too much for me, way too much for me. But um, there is so much there in the language. But generally, it's a, it's a thought or a concept, and that can be translated into English. You can pick that up. For us, because we process information differently, I think this right here is reflective of the way the Hebrews processed information. Because we process information differently, we, it may not be as obvious to us. Um, but once you really start thinking about it, then you can start seeing it. Okay, you got this? Inclusio, chiasmus. You're going to run into it a lot. You may see it. You may not. Some of you, your mind may just work that way, and you'll see it all over the place. Um, sometimes Chisholm will point it out, and sometimes he will not. Okay, number four. There are different ways or different forms, established forms that prophets used in giving their messages. What ones came to your mind? What was that? The woes, okay, I mean, that's often one that we can think of because when you read through the prophets, it's woe to this person, woe to that person. And so that would be an established form. Um, the, the words that 
Chisholm uses our judgment speech, woe oracle, the exhortation and or call to repentance, salvation announcement, salvation portrayals. And so, and then he just tries to explain each one of these. And again, when you're reading through the prophets, you probably will not have categories like this in mind, but when you read these various sermons, you will, you will actually feel whatever the essence of these established forms are. You will notice the difference. You will even feel a shift between sermons at times. And then finally, is there a structure to the books of the minor prophets? Yes or no? Who wants to say yes? Michaelina, you want to say yes? Why? Um, according to Chisholm. He said that is According to Chisholm. <laughs> He, a superficial reading will say that it's uh, disorganized and there's no structure, but if you carefully analyze it, it is. Okay, so some will say if you carefully analyze it, and there are a number of proposals that are out there, a number of proposals. But then you could also say no, why? A bunch of random speeches. And when you try to outline some of these books, you might say, I agree with the no aspect of this thing because it seems rather random to me. But overall, you know, what we do with this particular issue is not going to affect the way we understand the various prophetic books. And so you might, as you're working through it, begin to notice your own way of thinking about the prophetic books. And then yours becomes another proposal that's out there. We just don't know. What's interesting is they were compiled and put on a single scroll. Now the Talmud tells us that so they would not be lost. They were compiled and they were put together in some kind of order. Um, people would say Hosea is first because it was the longest. Well, Zechariah is long too and it's toward the end. And so wh why do we have this? Well, let's go look at the dating. Well, some of the dates of these books we aren't able to really pinpoint. And so when there's a question about whether or not a particular prophetic book is early or late. Some people will go because of the order. They'll say it's early because it goes early in the, in the set of 14. Some will say, no, it goes late because it's later. What we do know is the last three are post-exilic and they write after the exile, the people are back in the land. And so when people look at that, they say, well, that's obvious. So maybe the other ones are in order too. And we know that Hosea and Amos who are toward the beginning, were prophesying during the time period of the Northern Kingdom, but so was Micah. Um, Micah's a little bit later on, then the Northern Kingdom is gone. So these are early when there's still a Northern Kingdom. These are after the exile, when they're back in the land. So there's just a lot of different reasons that people posit. When we talk about the, the prophetic message itself and the components of a prophetic message, some think that it's even designed according to the prophetic message that it begins with more judgment and then just works its way around too. Okay, all right, any questions about that? All right, let's open up our notes to, you're on, we're on page 19 in your notes, I believe. Is that correct? Page 19 in your notes. And so let's look at what we have here today and what we wanna really work our way through. The development of the prophetic message. Now get your Bibles somewhere close by. I have mine somewhere. Here it is. We're going to be looking at a few passages today as we try to think about how we get from the beginning of the Old Testament to what we're going to be reading in the Minor Prophets. Because Minor Prophets develop sermons. Do we see that all the way through the Old Testament? How do we finally get there? And so point A in your notes there is the patriarchal period. The patriarchal period. So hopefully you understand when we use the word patriarch, we are talking about um, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. So we go back to Genesis 12 through 50. That's where we find the story of those four individuals. And point one there in your notes simply is trying to give the overall picture of what took place in the patriarchal period. During this time period, eminent leaders, prominent leaders gave guidance to the people of God. So you just had these prominent leaders that gave some guidance um, to the people of God. And when we think about who the patriarchs were, well, those were probably the major people who were doing that. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. We do know 
that the book of Job probably fits back into this time period of the patriarch somewhere. And so you've got people like Job, a very righteous man. You've got all of his counselors that came to him. Okay, they're very prominent individuals as well. And so who, who were these people but prominent people? But look at Genesis 20 in verse 7. In Genesis 20, verse 7. Eric, can you read that for me? Now return the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you will live. But if you do not return her, know that you will certainly die, you and all who are yours. Okay, so this is Abimelech, and he's on the outside looking in to this movement of God in this family of Abram. I mean, this is the very beginning of God's work. And so he's looking at Abraham and he identifies him as a prophet. So the idea here is the word being used is prophet, but other places in the more patriarchal period, we see concepts like man of God. And that's what Abimelech is identifying. This man is set apart somehow. Let's be careful with him. The word he uses is prophet. Remember, prophet is not this Israelite term that they quarantined and they used it for their purposes. This is something that's throughout the ancient Near East. And Abimelech is recognizing there's, some, there's something prominent about this particular individual. And then you see in your notes there, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. We could also go to passages for them as well, where we would see that during this time period, they had that prominence to them and God used them, met with them in dreams. Um, gave them words. Angels came to them and conversed with them. And so it, th this, this is what happened during the patriarchal period. I should have uh, these things up here, right? Now, during the, the next period is the Israelite period before the kingdom. The Israelite period before the kingdom. And you see for point one there is simply this point that is being made up on your PowerPoint slide. During this period, charismatic leaders, okay, Obviously, some people rose to the surface and they had a voice and people listened to them. That's what we mean by charismatic leaders. Gave guidance to the people of God, especially Moses, Joshua, and then the judges. So before we get up to the kingdom period, we're going to have the prophet Moses. He appears in Exodus and then really takes us all the way through the end of Deuteronomy. And then the book of Joshua. Joshua was the prominent leader then. And then we get to the book of Judges. We have all of those judges, just a cycle of people who God uses. They, again, are people who rise to the surface. I mean, even think about Gideon. The people come to Gideon. There's something about Gideon that they want to come to him. When Joshua takes over for Moses, it's obvious that he's the one that's going to take the reins of the nation. So, although prophetic activity existed, and we'll look at these passages later, its need was minimal. And really the, the basic reason during this long period of time that the need was minimal is because we've got two outstanding leaders taking us through the vast majority of at least our written record in the Bible, and it's obvious God is speaking through them. Moses is meeting with God face to face. He's not having visions and dreams. He's going up to Mount Sinai that's shaking and thundering and there's lightning and God's voice is being heard. Now that's, that's incredible. And so that's why we want to look at Moses just a little more closely. Now Joshua, we don't know as much about his interactions with the Lord because we don't know that much about Joshua in his everyday activities. But we do know angels met him. Uh, you know, and Joshua says, are you with us or against us? And the angel says, you know, actually, I'm the one in charge here. So uh, you fall in line. I'll lead the way on this one. So he had interactions. The judges, this is a weird time period for us because we don't exactly know the role that the law was actually having in their lives. We, we, read, the books, we read books like Ruth that probably is very early in the period of the judges. And they're very concerned about this kinsman redeemer concept. They understand it. Boaz understands it. The judges at the gate, the elders at the gate understand it. And so there's something going on there. But, you know, how God works in their lives, we see it in bizarre ways um, through people like Samson, 
Um, we, we do know that, that Gideon lays this fleece before the Lord and the Lord responds to him in some kind of way. But anyway, it's minimal during this particular time period. Now look at point number two there. We have Aaron and turn to Exodus chapter 7. Exodus chapter 7. This is where we begin to get just a little precursor to what it means to have a prophet. Caroline, can you read that for us? Verse one and two. Verses 1 and 2. And the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you, and your brother Aaron shall tell Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go out of his land. So, so now this is very interesting. Now drop to the bottom of your page where it says, Note, the relationship of Pharaoh, Moses, and Aaron provides an interesting picture of the role of the prophet. Now, you've got those three columns there, correct? You've got Moses, you've got Aaron, you've got Pharaoh. Now, I'm just simply lifting words out of this verse. And what does it say for Moses there? I will make you as what to Pharaoh? As God to Pharaoh. You see that right there in your text? I will make you as God to Pharaoh. And then for Aaron, your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. And then Pharaoh needs to hear a message from God as a person. Okay, this is a person who needs to hear a message from God. And so this right here actually captures this for us. Moses being as God, speaking words to Aaron the prophet, who then goes to a person who needs to hear a message from God, and he proclaims that message. You follow how Exodus 7, 1 to 2 really provides this framework for us to think about a prophet, what a prophet did. Now look also underneath number two, you've got Miriam. She is a prophetess, okay, in Exodus 15, in verse 20, we see the reference to this. This is after she, um, Moses sings this long song. Miriam has a response at the end as well. Uh, Brian, you at verse 20? Sure. Chapter 15, verse 20. So this really is a condensed of what we've already saying in the earlier part of chapter 15. But it says Miriam the prophetess. So now you've got Aaron being a prophet, his sister Miriam being a prophetess. Now again, this is not genetic. It's not through family that this is being passed down. God raises up these leaders. But we don't see a lot of mention about the prophetess role in the Old Testament. When we get to the books, the literary prophets, we don't have any that are written by a prophetess, but we must be aware God was working through females as well throughout the Old Testament. And so we have Miriam right from the very beginning established as a prophet. Now look at point number three, though. We want to look at Moses um, just a little bit. Moses becomes a really important person for us. And you can see this is simply moving down through your notes there. But he served as the true precursor to the prophets, even though in Exodus 7, we are utilizing, you know, Moses is God, Aaron is the prophet. It's truly Moses that serves as the precursor to the prophets. In uh, Deuteronomy 18, 15, 18, talking about a prophet that's going to come. It's going to be like Moses, like me, is what Moses says. Every prophet who follows him is one who seeks to turn God's people back to himself, meaning back to God, trying to turn God's people back to God. I mean, this is the role of a prophet, and Moses is the one that is that precursor. And so every prophet that follows is going to be something like he was. He is given special recognition as a prophet of God. Look at Numbers chapter 12. Numbers chapter 12. In verses 6 through 8, this is very important for the Lord to 
say about Moses? Olivia, do you have that? Romans, I mean, Numbers 12, 6 through 8. So this ends with a, a fairly strong warning. Why didn't you listen to him? This guy, when it comes to prophets, this guy is a cut above. That's that special recognition that's being given with him. It's not dreams, not riddles. Like the day I was reading in Daniel, and Daniel's saying, hey, time out, dude, can you explain to me what does this, what does all this that I'm seeing mean? And so he has to get an interpretation. Another part of that vision, the Lord sends Gabriel, a voice cry, cries out, Gabriel, go tell him what this means. And God is saying here, I don't speak that way to Moses. He actually sees my form. I stand before him, it's face to face. And so there's, there's special recognition that's given to that. But notice also, this is back in Numbers. And so even though we said that prophetic activity was more minimal back here, back in that particular time period, the Lord is actually letting us know here that He does work in this kind of way. So He is speaking to others. In other words, Moses is set apart, special recognition, I speak to him face to face, but the Lord is also acknowledging there are other prophets out there and I speak to them too, just differently than I'm speaking to Moses. So how much of that was out there um, we, we don't get a lot of that information in Exodus through Deuteronomy. We just don't. Um, the story is focused on Moses. He's seeing God face to face. So what else is going on out there? Uh, we don't get brought into a lot of that. But point number C there, he pointed to a future prophet. And then, of course, ultimately in the end, we see this very much as Jesus. John the Baptist is the forerunner to this prophet who is coming. Jesus is the one who fulfills this. But look at Deuteronomy 34. It's where we see this particular passage. I mean, Deuteronomy 18 has already brought that out as well. We're going to look more at that. But in Deuteronomy 34, verses 10 through 12. Jeff, you got that? Yeah. Since that time, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. For all the signs and wonders which the Lord sent him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh, all his servants, and all his land, and for all the mighty power, and for all the great terror which Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. Now this verse needs to be understood in light of Deuteronomy 18. Okay, so let's look back at Deuteronomy 18. So we can understand that because the, the book of Deuteronomy is concluding, concluding with, since that time, no one has risen up. Um, so in Deuteronomy chapter 18, in verses, let's read verses, verse 15. Um, Blaze, you got that? Okay, so the Lord is going to raise up a prophet like me. Now, Deuteronomy 34 is looking back saying, since that time, no prophet has arisen like Moses. So this is still going to be future. And ultimately, you can trace all of this and do it do, um, due diligence, but eventually it's going to be Jesus is the one who fulfills this particular category. Now, we've already looked at that little chart at the bottom of the page about the development of or the relationship between Pharaoh, Moses, and Aaron, how that helps us. So let's go over to page 20, where we see a fourth category that we want to pay attention to during this particular time period, and that is the 70. So let's look at Numbers chapter 11. Um, sometimes people don't remember the 70. They think, well, did I ever read that? But it definitely is there, and it's an important situation that takes place. In Numbers chapter 11, verse 16 and 17, Aubrey, you have that? Um, yeah. The Lord said to Moses, bring me 70 of Israel's elders who are known to you as leaders and officials among the people. Have them come to the tent of meeting that they may stand there with you and speak to you. And the Lord said to Moses, bring me 70 of the elders who are known to you as leaders and officials All right, so there's a, there's a spirit that is on <coughs> Moses. And this is where I would understand in the Old Testament you have special empowerment by the spirit. Remember we were talking about criteria? 
the Holy Spirit empowerment for these particular individuals. And again, others would disagree. But these kind of verses, I don't see how you can disagree with uh, the Holy Spirit empowerment being on special people because he's saying, hey, Moses, you need some help. The Spirit is on you. I'm going to put it on 70 others as well. It's not saying, well, everyone has the Holy Spirit. No, I'm going to put it on 70 others as well. But let's drop down to verses 24 to 30. And who we got here? Daniel, you got that? You got your Bible open there? You don't? You do? In uh, Numbers 11, 24 to 30. Okay, so you've got this special prophesying that takes place. The Spirit comes out. It's this really bizarre scene, isn't it? Because you've got two of the 70 who were not out there with the others. And so when the Holy Spirit comes on, they're in the camp and they're prophesying as well while these 68 are out there. And then Joshua in his youth, it's really interesting. He talks about it being from his youth. Hey, restrain them. You know, and Moses says, hey, listen, why? Are you jealous for me? I mean, do you, do you, are you trying to preserve some special identity that I have? No. Would that the Holy Spirit were come on everybody. I mean, that's, that's this humble attitude of Moses. It's so amazing that we find in this text. He doesn't want to guard or hold or keep anything close to him. He wants God's work to move out toward everyone around him. So the, the 70 become a really important part as well. The Spirit comes on them, but you've got that little arrow sitting there in the middle of your notes. What goes on the left side of that arrow is, arrow is the making of a prophet. The making of a prophet. Ultimately, in this arrow is necessitating or leading to the receiving of the Spirit. The making of a prophet resulted in or necessitated the, re the receiving of the Spirit. And so that's what we see here. It was just Moses. And then all of a sudden, he's going to be surrounded by 70 men. In order for that to take place, what needed to occur? The coming of the Holy Spirit on them. Follow me, what I'm saying here? And so there's a very important um, connection here between being a prophet and the Spirit coming. That's why it's one of the criteria that we had established earlier. There is something to, when you stand in the place of God to speak on behalf of God, there must be the Holy Spirit present for that to be taking place. So when we open up our Bibles to Hosea and we begin working our way through each of these prophets and their, and their messages, we must understand that the Holy Spirit is the one who's moving engaging their hearts and leading them to deliver this message to people who need to hear. All right, so the next section we have here is the Israelite period. That's point D or C there on the middle of page 20, the Israelite period. And this is the transition to the kingdom, really looking at Samuel's um, time period especially. Samuel is a very interesting person because he's prophet, priest, and judge. So in the time period of Samuel, we are still in the time period of the judges. Now this is, um, students don't always have their mind wrapped around this, but it's important for us to grasp it. We are still in the time period of the judges when we're reading about Samuel. That's exactly the way he functions. In fact, 
you can see the cycle. Remember in Judges, there's a cycle that we're going through. You can see the cycle again with Samuel because the people see Nahash coming up against them, the Ammonites, and they cry out, you know, really for deliverance, but they ask for a king instead of a judge. So we, we transition here. But Moses was the precursor to the prophets, right? Samuel is the first prophet proper. Okay, in other words, what we think of when we think of a prophet, Moses doesn't really fit in that category because he was in this category all by himself, this special recognition that he had. But Samuel becomes the one, and you can even go, even go to 1 Samuel chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, with three, chapter 3, verse 20. This is where God appears to him in a special way. So let's look at that passage, 1 Samuel chapter 3. Because we see God now moving and working in the way that we're going we're gonna to be thinking about prophets here in the days ahead. So we're transitioning to this particular time period. Chapter 3, 1 to 4. AJ, you got that? Then go down to verse 20. And ran to Eli and said, Here I am. And he called me. Now you can skip on down to verse 20. We're just going to skip all the intervening material there. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. Okay, so we have this special appearance that happens for Samuel. Now notice the context. That is given in verses 1 through 4. The Lord's word was not common. Okay, visions were not frequent. This was, this was a different kind of time period. There was not much activity. All of a sudden, God appears to Samuel. And then eventually, we see in verse 20, that he is confirmed as a prophet. The people see him as a prophet. So all of a sudden, this little boy, Samuel, now is established in a particular position. And then um, Jeremiah 15, 1 even tells us that the spirit, he embodied the spirit of Moses. And so he's not the, the prophet like me that Moses was talking about. But we are moving that plan forward. God is at work. God is doing something. So in Jeremiah 15, 1, point B in your notes there, he embodied the spirit of Moses. He was also God's servant to many. And so we begin to see a little bit about what the prophetic role is going to look like. As being the first prophet proper, we see that he has a ministry to individuals as well as to the nation. So sometimes Samuel goes to someone specifically, and sometimes his proclamation is to the nation. Sometimes an individual comes to him, and sometimes it's much more national. And you can see the verses there. But Samuel functions... Um, just get rid of that in as a major transition figure for the role of prophets in the nation of Israel. They will grow in prominence and he's the one who initiates this change, um, thrusting the prophet to a more visible role. Now, again, Moses was of a special kind of prophet. But when we read about Aaron, you read about Miriam, the prophetess, you just don't hear that much about them. Even during the period of Joshua, Judges, just not a lot of prominence. But now all of a sudden Samuel comes to the forefront and he is going to be a prophet that is going to begin having some kind of prominence. And so he is not in the background of the story. He comes forward a whole lot more like Moses was forward. But we begin to see the way a prophet's going to function. And so when you think about um, uh, the other prophets that we really know a lot about, like Elijah and Elisha, they fall very much into this pattern that we have here. Very similar. Now, when we get to people like Hosea and Joel and Amos, we're going to know them basically through their sermons. We aren't going to see too much of their everyday life. But you can imagine that their everyday life was something like Samuel. This is the way prophets worked. 
They received the word from the Lord and they delivered that. When we read the literary prophets, all we get is the delivering of the message. We don't get a lot of the details. With Samuel, we get a little bit of both. With Elijah and Elisha, we get a little bit of both. And so those are the ones we need to be thinking about their lives, Samuel, Elijah, Elisha. We're going to talk about um, Elijah in just a minute, but we need to be thinking that Hosea actually had some kind of life like that. Now, last time or last week, we talked about they had probably private homes and families. And so we've got to keep all of that in mind when we read our prophets. But also, you've got to keep in mind that they probably lived a life something like Samuel. And Samuel had other things that he was involved in. All you're going to get from Hosea is his sermons. Now, with Hosea, in chapters 1 through 3, we get a little bit more on him because it's one of the most astounding stories in the Bible, go marry a prostitute. I mean, that's unbelievable. And that whole story, the way it unfolds. But we don't generally understand how he was, you know, going up here and riding over here and his family was on vacation. They came back home. Then he delivered a sermon. Uh, to the people. We don't get that. With Samuel, Elijah, and Elijah, we get a little bit more of that. So keep that in mind as we go through um, these literary prophets. Now, point D. Point D, we have the Israelite kingdom, and I want to now focus the Israelite period, especially during the kingdom. During this period, prophetic activity becomes more a more distinctive trait of Israelite culture and religion. And so Samuel's the transition to this. And the prophets begin to serve an important role in the life of a kingdom. Now, there are some scholars out there, and I think that the, the text probably does point us there, where they try to make it clear that you actually see the prominence of the role of the prophet come because of the demand for a king. A king must walk in the ways of the Lord, must point people toward faithfulness of the covenant. And because they fail in that role, it increases, it heightens the presence of the prophet. So it's not just because we're in the kingdom, it's because now we've got this king figure here. And so God's going to need to also have prophets here that he comes in and continues to speak. This king is all powerful. What the king says, that's just the way it is. And so if a king's heart is not inclined toward the Lord and he's saying it and that's the way it is, that nation is in really big trouble. Do you follow that? If a king's heart is not towards the Lord, that nation's in trouble. So what does God do? He increases prophetic activity because the prophet plays a very crucial role. Now, the king still could say off with the prophet's head, I don't like what you're saying. But God continues to send prophets to try to capture the people's attention. So that's, that's your point one right there. Prophetic act activity becomes much more of a distinctive trait for the people. Now, what would be interesting to do at this time is to just try to read through some of the prophets and see what we can learn about them to see how they were different than what we've seen uh, previous to this time, how they were different from one another, even from Samuel to Elijah and Elisha, some of the distinctions that we have. But let's just look at Elijah. That's point number two. Elijah, we have point A there. He serves, and I think I've got that right here. He serves as the model for the prophetic character. So Samuel is the pro first prophet proper. In other words, he's the first one we see that actually functions in the way we're going to see prophets function throughout the rest of the Old Testament. But Elijah's the model for this. And there's so much about his life that shows the integrity, his love for the Lord, his willingness to do anything. You also see the personal flavor where Elijah's depressed and he's, he feels low. He's fighting through this thing. So he brings a very human element to what it means to be a prophet. He's the first covenant prosecutor. In other words, he gets right in the face of the people, unlike anything we've seen up to this point. And again, he's the model for that. Charging Israel with disobedience. And 1 Kings 18, 21 would be an example of that. As a result, his role is national. And so he was very well known. 
he delivered his messages to the nation. And his message serves to bring about repentance in the people, turning their hearts back toward the Lord. That is what a prophet does. And so model prophet confronting the crisis of the nation, which is sin and what they're doing with God, as well as what they're doing with one another, and then delivering a message for them to turn their hearts back toward the Lord. Elijah did this. This is the type of prophet that we find in the minor prophets, the literary prophets. In other words, their sermons are of the sort that you would think prosecution. And so oftentimes we even see a courtroom scene in the prophets, very much a courtroom where they are now being taken to court because they're in a covenant relationship. They have, they have rebelled against the contract, the covenant that they had set up, and now they sit and they are being prosecuted. And so you're gonna feel a lot of that when you go through the minor prophets. Well, Elijah is that first one that really pulls this forward for us. Now, point number three is etc. Okay, we've got lots of prophets that follow after this, and this is the model for us, and that's how it develops. The very last point you have in your notes, though, is concerning the New Testament prophets. In Malachi 4, 5, and 6, let's turn to there real quick. That's the very last book in the Old Testament. And we start getting a little bit of a forward glance here. In Malachi 4, 5 to 6. Christine, you got that? Can you read that for us? And then, so is that your verses five and six? Go ahead, just read the, just read verse six too. Okay, we're going to get into the book of Malachi, but that's an awful way for the Old Testament to end, isn't it? Or lest I come and smite the land with a curse. In fact, we're going to learn about this when we do Malachi. I'll just give you a hint right now. Um, the Hebrews didn't actually like that. And so they actually do a little verse switching around here so that the Old Testament ends on a much more positive note. We'll get into that when we get into Malachi. But here we see in verse 5, Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet. So after Malachi, we have what we refer to as the 400 silent years, right? I mean, the end of the Old Testament, before John the Baptist comes on the scene and Jesus comes on the scene. And so there's a little bit about what we might call a slowdown at this point. But we have John the Baptist, I mean, Elijah's going to come. Um, and this, again, is this looking forward to this Elijah figure. Is it John the Baptist? I mean, that's what many would think there. Um, and so we got the apostles that come on as well. But ultimately, Jesus is going to be one who really proclaims and is the one who leads the way as this prophet, the one that we're looking forward to. And so that's going to be really important for us. Now, I have a last point there with the New Testament prophets, underneath the apostles, those who proclaim the word of God faithfully today. So the question often becomes, what is the role of prophetic today? And so you have certain denominations within the church today that they actually have people identified as prophet so-and-so. And, you know, this, this person has a word from the Lord. We have people that are different parts of denominations within the Christian world that actually, you know, hold to a gift of prophecy and prophesying that takes place within a church service or within God's people. And what, what I believe is ultimately the fulfillment of the prophetic role in the church is those who proclaim the word of God faithfully. In other words, what would be prophetic activity for us is the preaching of the word of God on Sunday mornings. So what is a prophet doing? A prophet is moving into a contemporary situation where the people are struggling with their relationship with the Lord. And basically the prophet is saying, 
thus saith the Lord. There's nothing new here, nothing creative. It's simply taking them back to Sinai, their covenant relationship with the Lord, and reminding them of what God has called them to do and how he's called them to live. So what do we do on Sunday mornings? We gather together as people who, you know, many are struggling in their relationship with the Lord. And what do we do? We open up our Bible, remind ourselves that we're in a covenant relationship with the Lord, and we take the word here and we apply it to the contemporary situation week after week after week. Our hearts can so easily be disengaged, disoriented. And what do we do on Sunday mornings when we gather as God's people? We reorient our heart back towards the Lord. And we all need that reorientation, don't we? Every one of us in this room needs that reorientation. It's, it's so subtle the way the thinking, the worldview of the culture in which we live gets its little, whatever, hooks into us and just can pull us away from the Lord. And opening up God's word and being reminded of who he is, his greatness, his glory, and our relationship with him and the privilege we have to live in light of who he is, a response of gratitude for all he's done for us. It's that reorientation, what we need. Now in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, it does talk about, um, you know, a little bit more about the gift of prophesying. It doesn't flesh it out as much as I would like it to be fleshed out. Um, but from what I understand about Old Testament prophecy, and what I see God doing throughout His Word, I see basically it's gathering together, public reading, public preaching of the Word that is really the gift of prophecy. You follow that? I mean, that's what we're doing in church, aren't we? That's what we do in chapel. Uh, at least most chapels are focused on the Word. There's a lot of different varieties of chapels that we might have. Viola is not the church. Um, but in our local churches, this is what we must be doing. And so, in a local church, you can, you, can test the, you can test the prophets, right? By simply looking at the Word. What is this person saying? Is it consistent with what God's Word says? So we today as people have responsibility, don't we? And if someone is teaching something that you go, wow, that's fascinating, I've never heard that before, that's in, and that starts taking you in a direction, you have a responsibility probably at that point in time to, to verify that even with others and say, wow, this is kind of weird what this person is teaching. Can you help me understand? Because we have the standard right here and that's what needs to be taught. And so that's how that functions today, in, in my opinion. Okay, all right, that's the development of the prophetic message. And you can see what you have next in your notes is we wanna talk about the essence, essence of the message. And that's what we want to be our focus, the essence of the message. Oh, and there we have it. Alabama 52, Arkansas nothing. Zero. Just in case you guys are trying to keep up with Alabama Crimson Tide. You USC fans, I'm sorry. That was a, that was a long day for you, and I felt it. Our worship leader is a big USC fan, and, and he really takes it hard <laughs> when they lose. So I always feel bad on Saturday when they lose because he's got to lead in worship on Sunday morning. I'm just like, come, come on, be encouraged. The Lord is on the throne. There's something way bigger than USC football. So yesterday he sent me, a, or Saturday night he sent me a text and said, um, I'm over it, pulling for the tide. <laughs> so he, he was able to make it through it. All right, the essence of the prophetic message. Now, there are different points that we want to make as we go through this. We'll just have time to introduce this a little bit today, um, but we'll be able to make our way through it um, through on Wednesday. So differences in the message. The very first, number one there, what I want you to understand is the place of the message. So we're simply, if, if you aren't paying attention, you just accept all these messages as, you know, just being very generic. But there are distinctions to them. And so the place of the message, some messages are directed to Judah. Now that's the southern kingdom. Again, I don't want to assume that you have all this Old Testament knowledge floating around your heads, but these upper division Bible electives, what they do try to do is reinforce what you should know. So somewhere at the end, towards the end of, um, after Solomon's reign, the, the nation is divided into the north and the south. And so the northern kingdom, Israel. The southern kingdom, Judah, 
And so, usually, oftentimes, they are the focus of the, of the message. Now, there's going to be different terms used for the nation of Judah and Israel. I mean, Israel oftentimes is referred to as Samaria. That's the, the religious capital of Israel. Israel can be referred to as Ephraim. Um, because that's the largest clan. And so you're going to find different names for the nation. So when you run into that and you aren't sure what's going on, you know, just make sure. We'll, we'll discuss some of these things along the way. We don't have time to discuss everything in these books that we're doing. But, but it's very poetic. I mean, it would be nice if they would just say Israel or Judah, right? I mean, that would keep it real simple for us. But it's very poetic. And so they're, they're, they're trying to capture a certain sense and trying to make a certain emphasis. So to refer to Israel as Samaria, what that does is it throws your attention to the religious idolatry in the nation. Because Samaria, Samaria was an idolatrous place. The worship of the golden calf that was brought back up by Jeroboam. I mean, just an awful place. And, but we also have the nations. And sometimes a focus on the nations is to remind God's people that really everybody is responsible to God. Sometimes the focus on the nations is to let Israel know that, okay, this nation has done something to you. You don't take matters into your own hands. The Lord will deal with them. And so there's a lot of different reasons. And, you know, like in Amos, it's going to be very interesting because the Lord starts off and he's, he's proclaiming this message against the nations. And then finally, you know, he brings it around and he's going to, but then he, he brings the judgment to his own people as well. And so they're sitting there going, yeah, give it to him, God, take him down, go for it. Yeah. You know, so, and that can be the response of it going to the nation. And then God says, you know, it's coming back on you. It's like, whoa, wait a second, we're your people. Uh, everything should be cool with us. And the, no, I have something I want to say to you. And so sometimes in books you'll find all, all three. Now, eventually Israel is going to be gone as a nation. And so they're, because they disappear, taken into exile by the Assyrians, they're gone. And so Judah or the nations is going to become much more the focus as we move through this. Okay. Uh, one more. Well, let's just end there. I owe you some minutes anyway. This next point is a little more involved. And so we're going to pick that up on Wednesday. We will finish what we're talking about today. Biola University offers a variety of biblically centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.